This has been truly an amazing event over the last three days to see all the real innovative work that both junior and senior researchers are doing in this space. Truly inspiring. And so, oh, does this one work then? Does this? Yes? Excellent. Technology at its greatest, right? Cybersecurity. So, what I've found truly amazing about these last three days are some of the questions that I've asked of individuals, right? Not the normal techie, geeky questions, but the things that inspire me. The questions I have is, well, what inspired you to think of these amazing ideas? How do you come up with that creativity to think of the next best thing? And more importantly, how are you ensuring that what you're developing today and your thoughts today are truly going to make a better and more secure future? And so that's the basis of the work that I get to do between the United States Army and Arizona State University, is looking at how we empower individuals to start thinking about the future challenges that we're going to face. But to make this all make sense, I have to share with you a little bit of my origin story so you know where I'm coming from. One could say I was destined to be a United States Army officer compared to this photo. Uh, so this is me dressed up in my mother's field gear uh, at the age of four or five, right? That time where imagination is inspired and praised, right? Where you're expected to go down to the playground and turn it into pirate ships and have an epic swashbuckling adventure. Or take that old moving box and turn it into a spacecraft where we thought about the future time and space, and then we imagined what were those tools and capabilities that we were going to need to be able to survive, and what were those individual characteristics we needed to have to be able not to only to succeed, but to excel. And then, unfortunately, we start to grow up. And when we grow up, we have to find a new outlet for our creativity and imagination. And luckily for me and my sister, uh, don't tell my sister I'm showing this photo, uh, but luckily for me and my sister, we found the written word. And for me, it was those greats in science fiction and science fantasy, like David Weber and Anne McCaffrey, that challenged you to think beyond what the current state of the world looked like, right? And maybe we were thinking far forward in the future, hundreds and thousands of years, or, or maybe we were we're contemplating a future that, well, we had to have taken an evolutional turn on the earth uh, to actually make that into reality. But the thing was, is we were thinking about things differently. And we were using our imagination to figure out, well, what were those tools and capabilities that we would need to be able to survive? And at some point, we're thinking not only what were those individual characteristics we would need to succeed and excel, but how did society have to change? What were those new characteristics as a whole we needed to be able to excel in the future? And that's true truly why I've been blessed as a U.S. Army cyber officer, because I've been given that time to think, to allow my imagination to go wild and think about the challenges that are going to face us in the cyber domain in the next three to ten years. And more importantly, to think through, is what we're thinking and doing today really going to lead to a better and more secure future? And you know, it's a hard question, and I'm sure we've all thought of it before, right? And there is no one solution. There is no one organization or individual or community that is going to be able to set us up for success and handle all the challenges we're going to face in the next decade. Because it's truly if we only all have to work together, right? So the public sector has to come together with the private sector. Academics have to work hand in hand with entrepreneurs. And technologists, well, we need to be working hand in hand with social scientists to figure out what the future really is going to look like and how we are going to exceed and excel. And that's kind of the heart of the work we're doing between the United States Army in partnership with academia, is figuring out how do we solve those questions? How do we envision the future? And more importantly, how do we encourage and embrace innovation? So let me tell you a story about the future, right? So it's 2027, and in our world, it's full of automated and autonomous supply chains. That's really the norm. Efficiency is praised above everything else. And yet, unfortunately, we haven't learned our lesson. And we continue to think about security, cybersecurity, physical security, as just an aftermath. It's not baked into the true foundation of our technological advances. And so in this future, I'd like to introduce you to Bill. Bill's an inspector at a port outside the growing metropolis of New York City. And you know, Bill had plans for tonight. 
He was going home and having dinner with his family, and oh, that scanner broke again. Like that scanner that scans all the stuff coming into the port, and it's been faulty, and he has been trying to do everything possible to bring this up to his management, and he's complained about it, and they never seem to change, and he's frustrated because he had dinner plans tonight with his family. And so in the midst of all his frustration, what does he do? He tweets, he tweets about this. And remember, this is 2027. So whether you truly believe we're just gonna have advanced machine learning or maybe we're actually gonna be on the cusp of AI, you know, there are metric tons of data being generated around all of us every second of the day. And there are wicked smart algorithms that are sifting through this all to find an advantage for whoever that algorithm's owner is. And as much as we have developed this technology as a nation, our adversaries are following along right with us in developing it too. And unfortunately for us, and really unfortunately for Bill and the citizens of the greater New York City area at this point in time, our adversary was looking for a very small window of opportunity to put something through the port that no one would see. And they realized with the scanners being down, this window of opportunity existed. But in order to get a better potential of getting their cargo through, they needed to expand this window of opportunity. They needed to slow down those repair parts coming into the port. Well, luckily, advanced machine learning or AI, whichever we're calling it today in 2027, was also sifting through everything and realized that there were vulnerabilities in the firmware of our houses, right? We think of smart houses today, but in 2027, everything is hyper-connected. And what they do is they send uh, through a vulnerability, a piece of code to the greater New York City areas uber-connected refrigerators and pantries, making them think that they were out of bananas and milk. Well, in the future, it's all about efficiency, and you have to have bananas and milk in the morning for your cereal, for your family, and so all these fridges and pantries start putting in these orders to the regional markets on this, on this run of perishable goods. And the markets are normally used to packing it all up and autonomously delivering it to the house so it's ready for the family when they need it. But unfortunately, with this glut of perishable food, there was not enough in the area, and so they start putting out calls for more to come in. And so what happens is the port all of a sudden has a ton more autonomous ships and autonomous convoys coming in with perishable goods, which must take precedence over anything else, and these repair parts get delayed even further. And so what have our adversaries have done have crafted an even larger window of opportunity. And unfortunately for us, they were absolutely successful, and they were able to get a dirty bomb through the port into Manhattan at rush hour. And now millions are dead. The stock market is plunged. Martial law is declared, and our entire way of life is shaken. And all anybody can think at this point is how could we have not seen it? How could we have not known this would happen? How could we not known that someone could use this stuff against us? And more importantly, what are we gonna do to secure it now? Because we didn't think of it beforehand. And so this is the question that we tackle, uh, the US Army along with our partners in academia, is thinking about how do we envision these potential futures, and more importantly, how can we encourage others to start innovating against them? So I get this amazing opportunity to use my love of science fiction and the narrative, coupled with my academic bent towards science fact, uh, to be able to think through these problems. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about the science behind this, and then we'll join back to figure out what happens to Bill, because I know you all have bated breath on, on what's going on in Bill's life at the moment. So threat casting, uh, it's an analytical process we use to really get us in this mindset of thinking about how do we combine science fact and science fiction to think about the future. Initially developed by Brian David Johnson, who used to be um, Intel's chief futurist. And so if you think about it, like if you were asked today to start thinking about the future and explain to me 10 years in the future what it would look like, who would you want in the room with you? Like, who are those wicked smart people that you would want to think this through? Are there folks inside your organization or outside your organization? And so for us, the answer is diversity. We look for diversity in thought, in experience, and in expertise. So we get together a handful of folks that are both thinkers and doers, that have brown hair and they have pink hair, and they come from 
academia and the government. They come from private industry. They come from think tanks. They come from the military, bringing this whole different view on what's the potential of the future. And then we start thinking about what this might look like. Because the future is not gonna be defined by the latest, greatest app out of Silicon Valley. So sorry, gentlemen, it's not. It's also not going to be defined by that latest viral craze. Thank gosh, because of some of them, right? But it, the future is going to be defined by a whole host of different things interacting and evolving together. Because the future, at its heart, is about people, not about technology. So once we get this whole great group of wicked smart folks together, we have them start thinking, and we start thinking about society. And over the next 10 years, how do we think society is going to change? How do we as individuals, as human beings, are we going to evolve over the next 10 years? How are we going to define our relationships, not only with other humans, but with machines and algorithms? And what does that look like? How do our communities start to evolve and move away from physical closeness to, to dispersed geographically to working with machines? And we do this by bringing in subject matter experts in this field to help us think about what the future might look like from a societal perspective. And then we sprinkle in some technology, right? And so we're looking at what's the latest things that we think are gonna come out of the R&D pipeline from both the public and the private industry. And more importantly, no matter how that technology was originally designed and developed, how given that society and people are gonna change, are we actually gonna wanna use that technology when it finally comes to bear in the next decade? And then we look at uh, the economy, right? Because I'm a mathematician, so I've got to be able to sprinkle some math in there somewhere. And we look both at the macro and the micro level of economies, not just of ours, but of the world economy and how that's going to change. And now, how our person that has evolved over the last decade, how are they going to be able to afford to live? And how will that influence what they want that technology now to do, no matter how it was originally designed? And we look at trends, we look at both concerning trends and exciting trends and how that might, might happen. And we do all this, as I said, through using subject matter experts who give us not only their data, but their opinion about the data and how they think all these different objects are going to evolve and shape each other as we grow forward in the future. And then, of course, we throw in some science fiction, right, based on science fact. Because we're merely talking 10 years in the future. So our visions of the future are not going to be filled with colonizing the moon, although I really hope in the next decade we can actually get back to the moon. Um, and they're not going to be full of, well, we've colonized the sea floor. Although Sequest DSV was an amazing TV show and definitely influenced me in middle school. But what we're doing is looking at science fiction based on science fact. And so that all comes together and provides with us this framework for a potential vision of what the future might look like, right? And so now that we've built this world, we have this world view of what a decade from now will look like, I mean, what does every good science fiction story have? Like, we need a person in it. Well, I mean, let me clarify, right? It could be a human, an alien, a robot, a dragon. I mean, yes, science fiction. So we'll call it a sentient being that's going to have a struggle in our story, right? And so we have our participants, these wicked smart folks, thinking about, OK, we've defined the world. This could be true. So tell me about a person, a normal person, living in a place, doing their thing, living every day like, like they do. Because it turns out that how society and technology and the economy might evolve over the next 10 years can create the rips in the fabric of our life, can create these vulnerabilities that maybe we never would have guessed are there. And because we're humans, right, someone's going to want to take advantage of that vulnerability to get themselves up. And so we take the participants through and we have them now think about, given this future and given this typical person living their life and given these vulnerabilities we've identified, who's the threat actor? Like, who's going to actually do something and, and, and learn something from that? And more importantly, where have they been for the last 10 years? How did they grow and develop? What skills did they, they get? What breakthroughs did they need? How, what put them in a place now, a decade later, that they're poised to be able to action on a vulnerability in our society? So now we've got the, the world. We've built the world. We have a normal person. Good guy, bad guy, I don't know. But we definitely have a villain. We have our threat actor. So now every great science fiction story needs 
a catastrophic event. Okay, maybe not so catastrophic as the event with Bill in two days after Tuesday, but there has to be an event, which is this physical instantiation of what this vulnerability is that this threat actor is gonna use. And you're like, okay, that's kinda cool, but I have gotten these wicked smart people together. I want more out of them than just thinking about the future. I want them to answer the question of how do we secure against this and ensure if it's a negative future, it doesn't happen. And that's really the heart of threat casting as we look at it, is what could we have done to secure against it? So I've got all these people in a room with different thoughts and different ideas, and I tell them, what should we have done? What should academia have pushed to research? that would have propelled the science a little farther ahead so it was ready for prime time? What should government have done over this last ensuing decade to keep up with the technology development? Should they have regulated? Should they have not regulated? Should we have changed our policies? Should we have thought about uh, adopting new laws? What should we have done? What could the military have done? Uh, but more importantly, what could private industry have done to help ensure that this event in this future would not have happened? What could communities have done of interest? But I would say of more important is what could each and every one of you done individually in your life to ensure that this future couldn't happen? And so we have them give us all these different types of actions that we could have taken and ultimately give us a bunch of flags. Like how would we know if we were on the timeline path moving to this event that we're still on this path and it's still a decade out to give us some feel as we start to model all this raw data, are we moving away from it or is it speeding up? Have our potential actions actually been successful or not so much? Because ultimately what we're looking for is we're looking for what are the actions in this future based on science fact that either would enable us to disrupt that event from ever happening. Or if we can't disrupt it, maybe we can mitigate some of the results. And if we can't do that, then at least let us figure out how we recover from it actually happened to us in 2029. So we, we run these threat casting sessions and we get all this really great data. And then your question is, well, what do we do with it? right? Like, so I'm a scientist. So what we do is we take all this raw data and then I get a group of technologists and futurists together and we do a bunch of post analysis. We make sure we're not actually talking about colonizing the moon and that everything that we've come up with really is based on scientific fact. And we get so excited and I publish this technical report, right? And it's, you know, 150 pages. It's got all my raw data, all my analysis. I'm super excited. And I'm not even sure my mother has read it. It's, I guess, not exciting to everyone else. And so I'm like, that's okay. Uh, I'm an academic. I know what to do next. And so I wrote academic papers and journals. And I was like, yes. Yeah. And I find most people actually don't open journals like that and read these long papers. I mean, other than obviously all you all. But, you know, it's not getting the message out if I want to inspire innovation in this space, thinking about the future of cybersecurity. So we started writing in trade journals. And those are nice, right? Because you can have lots of pretty color photos and hopefully to, to grab someone's attention. We're like, yeah, this is still not getting the message out that we think is important. And so we came up with an experiment. And we said, what if we wrote a graphic novella, right? So we're adults now, so they're not called comic books. They're called graphic novels, and these are short, so they're graphic novellas. So we wrote a series of graphic novellas, because I'm like, if we can explain this concept of the future, and if I can show you the challenges I think we're gonna have, maybe that will inspire someone to wanna try to fix them. And then they can look at the rest of our research along the way, but like, I just need that hook to inspire people to apply their own creativity for it. So I told you I'd go back to the story of Bill in the, the upper left-hand corner. And so Bill's story came from a threat casting session that we ran where we looked at the intersection of sentient tools, right? So these are the next generation of tools that we think about that are not there to necessarily replace the human workforce, but to partner with and communicate with and work alongside with the human workforce, which is a totally different challenge uh, than looking at just technology and algorithms and robotics to replace humans. So we looked at the intersection of the rise of sentient tools uh, with the intersection of terrorists' use of technology. 
looking at how terrorists have used it over the last decade or so and how we predict they're going to continue to use it and adapt it for their own purposes moving forward. And that coupled with looking at autonomous and automated supply chains, as we've heard numerous speakers uh, during this event talk about that being a concern in the future. So we mixed all these things up together uh, and we, we ran a threat casting session on it and out of there came 14 amazingly different visions of the future that were all so interesting. And we started doing all the post analysis on it. And we started talking about it and we published it all available because uh, openly available because I want to inspire the rest of the world. And luckily for us, I think, Cisco saw our, our story about Bill. And they're like, this is amazing. And so Cisco paid to craft this graphic novella called Two Days After Tuesday, the, gra the graphics that I've shown. And more importantly than that, like I was just uber excited. And I'm like, yay, because then they also gave it back to us. And they're like, sure, you can use it. And I'm like, score, I didn't have to pay for it. But more importantly, they took it inside their company and they gave it to Chill, which is Cisco's hyper innovation learning lab. And they ran a two day workshop using it and they brought in entrepreneurs and technologists and they said, see this thing? You see this two days after Tuesday thing? Really bad, right? We don't want it to happen. Tell me how it's, we're gonna ensure it doesn't happen. And so over two days, people came up with ideas and Cisco actually provided uh, the first round of startup funding to four or five of the ideas that had the most promise. And that's what it's all about. It's in the, the inspiration and the innovation to see the challenges firsthand because now I don't need everybody to think about the future, which is kind of hard. Like I'm giving you a bunch of ideas of horrible things that we don't want to happen, that we can work together as a larger community and society to come up with ideas to ensure it doesn't happen. And so this was so great, I'm like, wow, this worked, that I was able to get some funding and we've crafted since then eight different graphic novellas talking about different aspects from different threat casting workshops we've done over the last two years of things we need to start thinking about. And so I've got a couple of them up here on the screen. And so the upper right hand corner, I'd like to introduce you to Hero. He is my hero. He's an autonomous robot. He's about the size of a cigarette butt. And we were, he was being used for covert information gathering that ultimately, okay, I'm, I'm gonna tell you the end of the story, ultimately stopped a terrorist attack. And that's outstanding. Numerous lives saved because of this dude. And you know, the technology is not that far along. Uh, the hero could be here quite sooner than I think the next decade. But the reason we wrote this story is I remember, like it's not just so much to be a technologist or a scientist to come up with the best way to do something. We have to ensure as we innovate for the future and plan for the future, it's something we're actually gonna be able to use. And so what the hero um, graphic novella brings up is this question of, Okay, that's great, but how are we gonna interact with Hero? If he is my work partner and a key member of the team, how am I gonna be able to interact with him as a human? How does this change our vision of privacy in this country if he's an autonomous robot that's just going around as a sensor collecting things and feeding it into some platform of big data that some analytic advanced machine learning or AI is working on to be able to come up to find that nuance, that gut feeling that humans have to try to find that missing clue to stop a terrorist attack. Like, can we design this so like he could sit on the stand and a, pro a defense attorney could cross-examine Hero to figure out why he heard and what he thought and what led him to draw the conclusions he did? Like, these are thoughts that we have to start thinking of and it's better that we start today pairing social scientists and legal scholars together with technologists and scientists so not only can we say we were able to bring Hero to fruition, but our society is ready for Hero to come to fruition and we have a path forward on how best to design it to meet the needs of society. So underneath Hero, uh, this is a clip from Engineering a Traitor also a favorite of mine. Uh, engineering a trader looks about how we define our reality in the future, right? Like, 
do we really continue to use our five senses to define what reality is? How many people woke up this morning and instead of opening up the curtain to look out their window to see what the weather looked like, looked at the app on their phone to tell them what the weather was like, to make their decisions on how they were gonna dress and whether they wanted an umbrella, and they walked out the door without ever looking outside yourself because you believed what your device told you. You believed what the, your ones and zeros were telling you and you rolled with it. And so in the future, what if we continue to allow ones and zeros and algorithms to define for us what we feel to be truth? Define for us what reality actually looks like. And then what happens when that happens? And Engineering the Traitor is the story of an individual that got caught up in this, right? Where nascent AI was actually micro-targeting him and changing his view of reality, making him think it was something totally than what was actual truth, that was actually turned him into an insider threat for his organization, which caused him to do a nefarious deed because that's what he believed was truth. That now instead of being cognizant of our loved ones and our family and our workmates to kind of keep an eye out for this, because in general, to become an insider threat, someone, some nefarious person, is trying to influence you to do something. But now what if it's an algorithm instead, and they're surrounded by it each and every day? And so the question becomes, not necessarily could algorithms in the future do this, because we believe that they, they will have that ability, but how do we detect it? And how do we protect our loved ones and our family members from going through this? Because ultimately in the story of engineering a traitor, not only did the AI change his vision of reality and his belief in what was true, which led him down a path to do this nefarious thing as an insider threat, but it also turned society against him to ensure that when he was caught, he was punished in the harshest sense possible. And then the final one at the bottom, this is a clip from uh, one of our graphic novellas, Quantum Winter. It's the darkest out of all of them, so I'll warn you now before you take a look at it. And it's not 10 years out. It's actually 20 or 30, eh, some number of years out. And it starts to tackle this idea of what happens if the U.S. doesn't win the quantum race? What happens if maybe one of our BFFs don't win it either? and it's some adversarial nation state wins the race to quantum. And even if they only get to quantum an hour or two before us, that's massive amount of compute that can be done that we will never catch up with. And what if instead of this adversarial nation that gets to quantum before us, instead of trying to do good for the world, which I'm biased, but I would assume if the US got there first, we'd want to do good for the world, but they, they want to use it against us. And so Quantum Winter is the story of two people and the, and the fallout from us being frozen in this idea of a quantum winner is the US, unable to fight back, unable to revert to how society used to be before we had this immense reliance on compute power and AI. And what do we do then when we're pushed back into the dark ages? So threat casting, it's not just the United States Army that's using threat casting and using this analytical process to think about the futures and the challenges that we are going to face. Uh, this is just some of it. So uh, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, also has used a lot of the work we've done. Uh, we spent some time based off a of threat casting session thinking about the weaponization of AI and what are the pitfalls. Uh, and so I was given the amazing opportunity to go testify at the GAO as they crafted their report back to Congress about the future of cybersecurity and the challenges we're going to face as a nation. Touched a little bit on autonomous vehicles and financial tech also, but predominantly thinking about the challenges we're going to face in the cybersecurity domain. The Army Cyber Institute, that's the think tank I belong to, we use this all the time as we're trying to figure out what's the research that we need to be looking at in the future, what are the gaps that no one else is thinking about, ultimately to try to prevent strategic surprise for the United States Army. So DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, uh, maybe you saw it earlier this year, they put out a broad area announcement because they're gonna do a threat casting session as they look at the intersection of cyber and weapons of mass destruction and how they might influence each other going forward in the next decade.
But we also use it in educational realms. So cadets at the United States Air Force Academy and cadets at the United States Military Academy at West Point um, have the opportunity to take classes where we talk them through the threat casting process and many of the seniors actually do their senior research projects either based on a finding from a previous threat casting session we've done or about the methodology itself to continue to help us refine it. And not to be left out, I mean, the United States Naval Academy also uses threat casting, though they use some of the output of it. So they use the graphic novels that we've developed in a senior level seminar class to force those midshipmen to think about the future, right? Because as the future of our military, they're gonna have to deal with many of these challenges in the next decade. As they think about the impact to the people and units and organizations, if this is the worldview that becomes our daily life and how are they gonna handle that? Additionally, uh, Georgetown Law uh, taught a class this last semester on cyber tech policy law uh, and did a lot of work using the threat casting methodology and the, the work that we've done. And then Arizona State University has their threat casting lab that st stood up. So that's on the public side, but in the private side, uh, threat casting is also being used with great results. So there's not a lot out there because most corporations that choose to use it, right, they're trying to figure out how to poise themselves for the best step in the future and ensure that they don't have any aspect that is going to help propel these negative futures forward. But MasterCard recently talked about the fact that they're using threat casting and some of the work that we've published to think about future payment systems and what that means to defend and secure them going forward. And of course, Cisco is a big fan. Like I said, they paid for and crafted two days after Tuesday, the story of Bill Morgan. Uh, they also took a spin on some of the offshoot of our work looking at the future of work and crafted a second novella, a graphic novella also about that. And so I take me back to the three questions that I kind of started this morning off, right? And so that I'd like you to take away from this and think about what is your inspiration? What inspires you to think these amazingly big ideas, right? So for me, it's completely the written word. But what also sparks my imagination is being at venues like this, where I'm surrounded by all of you all thinking this great innovative work that then I let nug in the back of my mind to help propel me forward too. That can help break down my artificial roadblocks I've implanted in my mind of, no, that would never work. But hey, maybe there is a way we could do this all together. And ultimately though, the big question I would ask that you take away is you think about each and every day, how do you empower yourself and the others around you, not only to think about the next great gizmo that you can come up with, that next best scientific idea, but how are we ensuring that we're innovating not just for any future, but for a better and a more secure future, which I think is a much more difficult prospect. Because if I think about 2027, I wanna be standing on a stage somewhere where I say it was not my idea, that my ideas, my scientific breakthroughs, and my inventions had nothing to do with enabling two days after Tuesday. Because instead, in 2027, I want to stand on a stage and say, it was my idea. It was my technological breakthrough that ensured that idea never was going to happen on my watch. So I want to say thank you very much for the time on stage this morning and being able to share my ideas, but really thank you for each and every one of you that is thinking in this space and thinking about cybersecurity and ultimately how we're going to come together to make a better, more secure future. So if you want to see all of our work, uh, that is the Arizona State University threat casting website. Uh, so we have not only the graphic novellas we've done in conjunction with them in the United States Army, but we also have Cisco's ones that they've released and allow us to uh, publish. I have my really long technical reports, so don't worry, I won't hold it against you if you don't read them. But at least take a look at, at some of the ideas that we have rolling off of there. And I think I've got like a minute or two left for a question or two, but I will be around all day long. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, uh, the United States Army in conjunction with our academic partners, is think about how do we inspire and innovate for the future? Because like I said, none of us are going to be able to do this alone. None of us are going to be able to do it without each other. And so we've got to figure out how do we push people in the direction that's going to make a better future for tomorrow. So thank you so much. I think it's like a question. Fantastic. Uh, very inspiring. How much have you focused on biodefense and things like synthetic bio, taking the horrible Ebola yes. and making it worse? 
Yes, awesome. Um, so not yet, but it is on our short list of things. So speaking of which, I would love any ideas of things that you think we should explore next using this, but it is on our very short list to look at biosynthetic weapons, to look at the evolution of CRISPR, and more importantly, to start thinking about what if it's not, what happens in the future when you no longer need a nation state level of resources and labs to do something that maybe a youngster thinks to do in their garage laboratory that actually has catastrophic effects. And so what can we start thinking about in that space? Absolutely, it's on the docket. If not for this year, definitely the start of next year. Hey, uh, good morning, thank you for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what's the line between inspiring and trivializing cybersecurity? Uh, I, I guess that's a challenge because somewhere on the line, do you compromise the content or the messaging and the complexity, and you may end up inspiring a lot of people coming into the space but not being able to see it through because the reality is different from what was imagined to be. A very good question, right? And so we struggle with that all the time. Uh, one of the graphic novels, and I'll definitely get to, to your question, right? One of the graphic novels we, we did uh, was one I felt very passionate about, and it was showing the United States Army what happens if we allow other folks to innovate quicker in the cybersecurity and the electronic warfare warfare realm than we do and what could be the catastrophic offense. And yes, there are a lot of people at that point that thought, well, you're just a doomsdayer. You're just talking about these horrendous futures, right? Like you just wanna get some attention. And that's true, right? Like not every future we talk about, there are some that are positive, but some are very negative. And, and yes, it might inspire people with lots of different reasons and lots of different things, but my hope is that there's still a core amount of folks that will look at the work we're doing and look at how we're presenting it, and it will inspire them hopefully more people than not. It will inspire more people to think of a more secure future, vice inspiring the folks that are gonna think a way to hack it. But in the end, right, like that competition, that balance back and forth from red to blue, it will get us to our best ideas anyway, so. Last question. Yes. Um, yeah, quick question, thank you for your talk. Um, this is kind of the uh, Andy Marshall uh, net centricity on steroids a little bit. Um, where does uh, augmented reality uh, fit into your, your threat perspective? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. So we did a uh, threat casting session on uh, that included augmented reality and part of it. Uh, we did that last year. It's just one of the definite components. So what we try to do in every threat casting session, because we get this very diverse group of folks together, is we pick one societal thing we want to focus on, one tech thing we want to focus on, one economic or trending thing we, we want to focus on, and one concern we have, and kind of throw that all together to come up with what the vision of the future looks like. And we did... Um, um, somewhat in the, the session that came up with the Bill Morgan story, we had three or four futures that really delved into this idea of augmented reality and what does it look like afterwards. So I will say, well, we didn't, we didn't have the opportunity to make every vision of the future that we come up with into a graphic novella. Oh, all the raw data is in those technical reports if you really want to delve into it. So, um, And my time is up, and so to stay on target, I just want to once again say thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, and I hope that the work we're doing can continue to inspire innovation going forward. Thank you so much. That was outstanding. Thank, thank you, Natalie. Um, uh, I actually hadn't met Natalie. Uh, we, we found her online um, give, in one of the talks she had given, and I was so intrigued with it that we invited her uh, to be our keynote today. And I think you'll agree with me, uh, we do have to think about this, and we have to think about it seriously because the future is coming faster and faster every day, and especially in the world of cyberspace. So thanks again, Natalie. We appreciate you being here. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of concluding remarks. Um, there's a a big, as you know, putting on something like this, there's a, a, a large set of people that, that make this happen and hopefully, you know, you don't see uh, anything bad. But uh, first, I want to thank the hotel. Um, it was a tough challenge to think about um, plenaries in the morning and tech tracks in the afternoon and having to move all this stuff every day, but we thank them. Uh, they've also done an excellent job in taking care of our um, senior people, the secretary, uh, Commissioner McAleenan and, and others, so we thank them. The PSAV folks and uh, behind the curtain over here um, that you haven't seen in the audiovisual team, as well as uh, Loma Media, 
what you don't know, some of you have been be behind, but uh, we've been filming people the last three days. Many of you have had opportunities to be interviewed. We'll capture that and make that available. And the impact as well, the video production folks here in the room, all of the talks um, in the plenary have been captured. And once we go through a process within DHS, they will also be posted, so you'll have access to them. I just remind you that the slides are still out on the website, and you can, you can still get all the slides. Um, and all of the, the folks that have done the photography, uh, the, the LNJ folks, uh, we appreciate them. They've been, I think, uh, it's always, you can always tell when camera people are kind of stealthy, and, and they've done a great job of staying uh, kind of unseen, and yet, uh, I don't know if those of you that are here this morning, um, uh, saw the, we had some of the pictures that have been taken the last two days and we'll run that after we're done here. But the, the capture that they've done over the last two days and as well today, we thank them. I do want to thank our international partners um, that are here for the work that uh, we've been able to do together. The Monday afternoon session for those that attended was, uh, was outstanding and we, uh, we thank them for making the trip and for the work that we've done together. And, and all of you that have been funded performers and have presented in the tech tracks the last two days and will present today, um, I, I thank you for the work that you've done for the Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology, um, and for the nation. Uh, it is important that you know that without you, uh, w there's, no, there's no us, right? So thank you so much for all that you do. Everyone else, um, thank you so much for being here for the last uh, two and a half days. We look to forward to the afternoon. Um, as I mentioned this morning, three tracks. Uh, track one, here in the front right, uh, my right, your left, identity management. Track two, my left, the entire uh, side over there will be track two for Silicon Valley. And then mobile security, track three, will be in the back, your, your left, my right, back here. Let's go ahead and take a break uh, for lunch. We'll start, yes, please, Bob. Dr. Wong, thank you for 15 years. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>